I'm Dr. Lauren Stryker, and on today's Inside Information, I'm going to dive into postmenopausal bleeding. Because look, it's always disconcerting to have unexpected vaginal bleeding, but it is particularly unsettling when it occurs years after your uterus and ovaries have closed for business, and you no longer even possess a pad or a tampon. And it's not just about making that midnight run for sanitary products, it's that stomach-dropping fear that blood equals cancer, that causes women to spend hours consulting Dr. Google for some reassurance. But in spite of the fact that most women imagine the worst, in the majority of cases, postmenopausal spotting or bleeding is not an indication of anything serious. If you see red and you're not supposed to, the first step is to determine where the blood is coming from because blood on the toilet paper doesn't really tell you where it originated. It could be from the vagina, that's true, but it could also be from the rectum, the bladder, maybe a scratch or irritation from the vulva. So it's not always obvious. When in doubt, the place to start is with the tampon test. Very simple. Take a tampon, and yeah, you might have to borrow from your daughter or do that midnight run for the tampon, but you take the tampon and you put it in your vagina. You leave it there for a short period of time, you pull the tampon out. If it's white, well, that tells you that the bleeding was not coming from the vagina. But if the tampon does have blood on it, yes, then it looks like that it is a gynecologic source. It doesn't tell you if it's coming from the vaginal walls or the cervix or the uterus, that's gonna require a trip to the gynecologist. The best time to see your gynecologist about abnormal bleeding is while you're bleeding. And I know that's counterintuitive and a lot of women are, are hesitant to go to their gynecologist or to be examined while they're bleeding. But the truth is, is first of all, the bleeding may not go away, but even more important, that's the best way for me to tell where the bleeding is coming from and also how heavy it is. I mean, your description definitely helps me out, but I've learned over the years that one woman's spotting is another woman's hemorrhage. So first I'm gonna start by talking to you and then I'm gonna put a speculum in. Once I put the speculum in, I can see, is there bleeding coming from the vaginal walls? Is it coming from the cervix? Or is it actually coming from the uterus? So let's say it's coming from the vaginal walls. What would cause that in a postmenopausal woman? Well, the number one thing that would cause it is vaginal dryness. As many women are aware, after you're no longer producing estrogen, the lining of the vaginal walls becomes very thin and very dry. Some women have no symptoms, they have no idea that that's happening, but a lot of women are very much aware of it, either from pain with intercourse or just general irritation, dryness, and discomfort. When someone has thin, dry vaginal walls, they also bleed very easily. Sometimes it's provoked. It may be as a result of either intercourse or trying to have intercourse or putting something in the vagina or some other kind of sexual play. But honestly, sometimes it can be completely unprovoked. Out of nowhere, someone can have a bloody vaginal discharge just because the walls of the vagina are thin and dry. The second thing that might cause bleeding from the vaginal walls is an infection, something like a yeast infection or even a vaginal bacterial vaginosis can cause a lot of inflammation in the walls of the vagina. And again, because they're thin, because they're dry, they bleed a lot more easily. Now, on the list, but at the bottom of the list, is something like a vaginal cancer. It can happen, it does occur, it's certainly not common, but it's, the one reason that you cannot let this go, even if you think it's coming from the vaginal walls, you need to have a gynecologist take a look to make sure that there isn't something growing that shouldn't be. What about if the bleeding is coming from the cervix? What are the causes of bleeding from the cervix in a postmenopausal woman? Well, one of the more common things is a cervical polyp. A cervical polyp is a benign mushroom-like growth that either starts in the canal of the cervix or in the outside of the cervix, and it will bleed. Usually it's just spotting, generally not heavy bleeding, and it can occur after intercourse, or it may just occur with no provocation at all. But that's probably one of the more common things that we see as a gynecologist. And fortunately, these are benign. These are things that can be easily removed in the office, and then it's the end of the story. You can also have cervical inflammation from a variety of things. Dryness can cause that, but so can infection. And if you are concerned that you may have been exposed to a sexually transmitted infection like gonorrhea or chlamydia, one of the first symptoms for many people is bleeding from the cervix that just kind of looks like a mucousy, bloody discharge. 
Could it be cervical cancer? Sure. Again, at the bottom of the list, and I need to lay my eyes on it to see, and certainly if you're not up to date with your pap tests, you need to have a pap test. Even if you're over the age when you think you're not supposed to be having pap tests, we need to take a look at the cervix, and if there's any cause for concern, then obviously I'm gonna do that pap test. If the bleeding isn't coming from the vagina or from the cervix, well, then I assume it's coming from the uterus. And the list of things that can cause bleeding from the uterine cavity is actually very long. One of the first things that we often think about is if someone is newly menopausal, perhaps still perimenopausal, sometimes ovaries kick in for one last hurrah. And you might even get a little mini period, even if you're after that 12 months when supposedly you are done with periods. So that's always a possibility, but we need to figure out if that's the case. The second thing is, is that there may be a growth in the uterus. And when I say growth, I don't mean cancer. I mean a non-cancerous growth. Polyps are the most common thing. I've already talked about polyps that originate from the cervix, but you can also have a benign polyp that originates from the wall of the uterus. And quite frankly, it's not unusual for some women to have a whole garden of polyps so that they spot all the time or even have a little bit heavier bleeding. The other growth that we sometimes see in the uterine cavity is a fibroid. Now, fibroids are generally benign growths that are muscular growths that originate from the wall of the uterus and they usually only grow in women of reproductive age who are premenopause. When we see a fibroid in a postmenopausal woman, if it's growing or if it's causing bleeding, it doesn't mean that it's cancer, but we don't ignore that. It is a cause for concern. The other thing that we always look at in terms of postmenopausal bleeding is the lining of the uterus. After menopause, the lining of the uterus is supposed to be very thin. It's supposed to be very inactive, even if a woman is taking hormone therapy. If the lining is building up, if it's getting thick, well then sometimes that will cause bleeding as well. Why would a lining get thick? Well, sometimes it's just an abnormal growth of tissue that's not cancerous, but in some cases it does indicate either a precancer or a cancer. Once I've determined that the bleeding is coming from the uterus, I need to know which of those possibilities is causing the bleeding. So I'm gonna to start to do some other tests because quite frankly, from an exam, I can't see inside your uterus and I'm not gonna know what's causing the bleeding. So first test, we're gonna do an ultrasound. Most people are familiar with ultrasound from at some point in their life, but basically this is a test that's generally done in the office. Uh, where we use sound waves in order to get a picture of not only what's going on inside the uterus, but I can get a very accurate measurement of the thickness of the lining of the uterus because that's important as well. And while we're at it, we always look at the ovaries and at the other pelvic structures to make sure there's not something else going on. Sometimes we take it one step further and do something called a saline infused sonogram or SIS. And what this is, is it's an ultrasound in which we put a little flexible catheter through the cervical opening in order to inject a little bit of fluid. And and this separates the walls of the uterus so that I can turn a two-dimensional picture into a three-dimensional picture. And this is very useful in terms of discovering if there's a polyp or a fibroid, or sometimes even if it's just a little more difficult exam to interpret, someone who's maybe been on tamoxifen or who's had prior uterine surgery. The next step in terms of determining what's going on is to do a sample of tissue from the lining of the uterus. You know, most women, of course, are familiar with pap tests, and pap tests sample tissue, but they only sample tissue from the cervix. So if I want to get a sample of tissue from the uterine lining, that is done by doing a procedure called an endometrial sampling, endometrial biopsy. Sometimes it's referred to as a pipel. The way that this is done is it's done in the office. I put a speculum in just like for a pap smear and I thread a small flexible catheter through the cervical opening to insert it into the uterine cavity. Once the catheter is in the uterine cavity, then I aspirate some tissue, meaning no cutting, no needles. There definitely is some cramping involved and that can range from very minimal to really difficult, painful cramping. But I promise you that even if you do have bad cramping, it generally only lasts about 10 seconds. And if you know in advance that you're gonna have an endometrial sampling, take an Advil 
some other non-steroidal anti-inflammatory about an hour before, and that will really ease the cramping. Once I get that tissue, it goes off to the lab, usually takes three to five days for the pathologist to look at it and let me know if there's any concern in terms of a precancer or a cancer. Once I take all those steps, I generally know what's going on. I can tell you, is it a polyp? Is there a small fibroid there? Is there an abnormal buildup in the lining of the uterus? Do you need any treatment? But sometimes those tests are not definitive. And if that's the case, then generally the next step is to do a D and C and hysteroscopy. Now D and C, D stands for dilatation, meaning dilating the cervix, opening the cervix a little bit. C stands for curatage, which means that we actually put an instrument inside the uterine cavity so that I can remove a lot more tissue than I can with an office endometrial biopsy. And then the most important part, quite frankly, is hysteroscopy. Hysteroscopy refers to taking a little scope with the camera, putting it through the cervical opening, and then I can actually see what's going on in the uterine cavity. If there's a polyp, I can see it. If there's a fibroid, I can see it. If there's one area that looks suspicious or I'm concerned about, I can see it and I can do a biopsy. I can remove a polyp. Sometimes I'll find polyps that just didn't show up on ultrasound because they were too small or maybe they were hiding behind a fibroid or something else. So the DNC hysteroscopy is always gonna be definitive in terms of finding out what was causing the bleeding from the cavity of the uterus. So, okay, let's talk worst possible case scenario. You know, it's not a polyp, it's not a fibroid, but in fact, at the end of the day, I get the tissue back and it shows that it's endometrial cancer, uterine cancer. Well, this is the thing. First of all, keep in mind that most results are reassuring. This is a rarity. 90% of the time, I'm not gonna find a cancer. But if I do find a cancer, what you need to know about uterine cancer is that number one, it is the most common gynecologic cancer. And that always surprises people. They're like, look, I don't ever hear about anyone who has uterine cancer. I don't know anyone who died from uterine cancer. And the reason is, and I'm not minimizing that it's cancer, but the reason that you don't hear about it as much is because most women do very, very well. And in fact, if it's diagnosed in its earliest stages, stage one, it's curable. It's curable 96% of the time. And that's why it's so important if you're having abnormal bleeding, even if it's just spotting, that you check it out, that you don't let it go. Because in the unlikely but possible event that it's a uterine cancer, you want to find it when it's at its earliest, most curable stage. So if you see red, don't put off going to the gynecologist. Make sure that it's not something that you wish you'd found sooner.